Today I am joined by, dare I say, cult icon already of Adelaide United, Lockie Barr. Thank you so much for joining me today, Lockie. Thanks, mate. Pleasure to be here. So my opening question is always a quite easy one. Just where did your passion and love for football first begin? Um, my passion and love for football came from, I would say, my dad. Um, he's always been a um, lifelong football fan. He used to play himself. Um and it was about when I was five years old, um, he took me down to a local club uh, called Westlands United, who are based in Wyala, country, South Australia. So he took me down there. And um, yeah, just from there, I guess that's where my passion for for football and, and my love for the game started. I mean, at that age, you don't really think about too much. You just enjoy going down training, playing with all your friends and and just enjoying it from there. And then obviously, as you progress through the age groups and as, as you get older, things start to become a bit more serious. But for me, that passion and, and the love for the game has always been there. But that's probably definitely where I started. And when was the moment for you where you thought to yourself, you know, chasing professional football as a livelihood could be something that's realistic? Um. It was always something from a young age that I wanted to do. Um, I was always um, determined to try and get the best out of myself, to give myself the best chance to make it to a professional level. Um, I definitely, coming from Wyla country, South Australia, it's always a little bit difficult to, I guess, make it to the professional level just because in the country you don't have access to the resources that I guess players of my age would have in a city like Adelaide. Um, you know, you've got access to good coaches, good facilities. Um, you know, you're training a lot more in the metro areas. So for me, coming from the country, I knew it was always going to be difficult. So I had to do things. Um, I had to rely a lot on myself and and my family as well to to try and get better because it got to a point there where I was playing seniors um, for my local club, Westlands United. And at times, like we were trained Tuesday, Thursday, but a lot of times we would only get maybe three players to training because... A lot of the boys were doing shift work and, and couldn't make training for whatever reason. So um, I'd rely on myself a lot to, I guess, do a lot of individual sessions to try and develop. And, and I knew at some point I'd have to move to Adelaide to give myself the best chance. Now, you're currently at Adelaide United, but what a lot of people might not realise is that this is actually your second stint at Adelaide United. You signed mm -hmm. on to them for their youth team oh, about 10 years ago now, so you were still a teenager when you first signed for Adelaide United, obviously it's a bit of a big step up going from playing, you know, football just for the fun of it to doing it in this full professional setup. So when you first joined their academy, what were some of the things you found the most difficult? Um, when I first joined Adelaide United's youth team, it was a big step up. So I basically come from, um, I moved from Wyler to Adelaide, had a bit of a stint with a club called White City, who are now in the, or now known as FK Beograd in the MPOSA. So I played a season there. So that was a really um, good season for me in terms of, um, I improved a lot in that year and I got rewarded with a Adelaide United youth team contract. And unfortunately didn't go the way that I was planning to. We had a lot of players back then who were in the senior team that would drop down into the youth team being central defenders so that meant that um you know it would filter down so i wouldn't end up playing because the senior boys needed to play um but being in that environment it was one that you know i did improve a lot as a player although i wasn't playing as many games as i would have liked but you know you're playing with people of your own age and you know it's the best players in the state so it was a really good um, environment at the time and um, one I look back with um, where I did feel that I did improve a lot being under or playing and training in that environment. Football can be quite a you know relentless industry it's pretty cutthroat so when you got let go of Adelaide United their youth team you know first first off you weren't really given a chance how difficult mm -hmm. was that for you to come back from that and still chase this professional dream? Yeah, it was tough. It was back then, I think that we had maybe three boys from the youth team that progressed on to the first team. And then the rest of us, you know, you sort of just go back to your MPL club. Um, so it does sort of, it doesn't put your career on a hold as such. It is maybe, um, maybe a slight step back because you were, you know, everyone's aspirations in the youth team is to go on to the first team. So when you don't make that jump to the first team, you sort of have to reevaluate about you know what can I do next to make sure or give yourself a good opportunity to get to another club in the first team or come back to Adelaide United. So yeah, it was challenging. Um, it was difficult 
not making the first team. But I think at the same time, I wasn't ready to make the first team at that time. So I knew by going back to um, my MPL club in White City that I knew I could, you know, take what I'd learned training in a in a professional environment with the youth team and, and taking back to White City and, and continually improve my game. Now, your next move after White City is quite an interesting one because it's not, you know, it's it's a move that people often aspire to going to Europe, but it wasn't obviously a top tier level. It was at a club called Internationale Berlin. I'd be lying to you if I said I knew who they were. Don't even believe they have a Wikipedia page. But it even yeah. says on your wiki, for some reason, it must be important that you were doing this club and working in an ice cream parlor. So what was your whole experience in Germany like and, you know, juggling, chasing football and working in this ice cream shop? Yeah, it was. Um, yeah. So after the Adelaide United youth theme, I went back to White City to play and um, obviously I still had aspirations to make it to, to a professional level, but um, I knew that if I wanted to do it, it is, it can be quite difficult going from MPL to the A-League. So I thought I would try my luck overseas to try and um, play in a better competition, one that's, you know, training more, um, playing against better players, playing with better players, better coaches and et cetera. So I made the move to to London first and um, spent some time at a club called Brentford um, with their under-23s just as a train-on player. So I was there for maybe, I think, four months just training. And then I had a contact in Germany, which was based in Berlin, and um, he was based at the club that you mentioned before, FC Internationale. And um, they were in the sixth tier of the German football pyramid. Um, they were trained in the evenings, and that's where the ice cream parlor come in. So obviously, because you know we weren't getting paid that much as a semi-professional player, you'd have to substitute the rest of your income um, through a part-time job. So I was working in an, in a, a ice cream cafe shop um during the after yes i'd go to german school in the morning go work at the cafe in the afternoon and then go to training um and i did that for a year and yeah it was a really good experience not only football wise but also living in a different country a different um city in berlin i'd never been there before but um one that i look back on and i had a really good time and improved a lot as a player and also it helped me a lot off the field as well i said you know living in a different country speaking different language and um yeah, realizing that, you know, the world's much bigger than than Wilder and Adelaide. Now, I love talking to footballers when they go to, you know, crazy parts of the world about food and culture. Mm -hmm. I know Germany's not that crazy, but I've got to ask you, working in an ice cream parlor, was there any weird or interesting or good flavors of German specific ice cream that we might not know about here in Australia that you'd recommend? Yeah, there were a few. So the people that I was working um for they would have some real um, different flavors. Like you would have, obviously have your normal, you know, vanilla, lemon, um, ice creams are real basic ones, but they'd had about five or six like goat's cheese ice cream. They had like a honey pistachio one, um, a, a vanilla bean ice cream from Madagascar. Um, yeah, all these different erotic flavors and, and some of them were were really nice. I mean, to be honest, I'd be opting more towards the vanilla than the goat's cheese, but you know, back onto football, your next yeah. to club that many of us know here in Australia. We've had a few Aussies, you know, play for them in the past. They've obviously had a famous FA Cup run as well. Bradford City, massive team, well, massive fan base, big football culture in England. What yep. was it like to join such a big club and how did that move come about? So... The move came about, so I was playing at FC International and my coach was a um, was a scout for Bradford and he just said, look, if you play for me for a year, then I'm going to try and get you um, a move to Bradford. So I played for him for a year and then I went on trial to Bradford City and, and yeah, it ended up being a successful trial and I signed the following season. And, yeah, going into a club like Bradford, who at the time we were League One, so that was third division on the English football pyramid. And... As soon as I got there, I realized how big the club was. They'd already sold 20,000 season ticket uh, holders. And this is like, you know, for a League, league One club, that's huge. Um, and they're still doing the same. Now they're in League Two at the moment and they still have the same amount of season ticket holders. Um, so obviously the fans are extremely passionate about the game. Um, everyone that lives in Bradford, you know, they work during the week, but everyone is looking forward to that, the game on the weekend, Saturday, three o'clock. And yeah, it was just huge playing for a club like that. Obviously, they'd been in the Premier League a number of years before that 
and I still feel that they probably are a championship sort of club just haven't been able to, I guess, get those promotions. Obviously, they got relegated to League Two, but you know, with the fans, their stadium, and the amount of the amount of money that they put into the club is definitely, I would say, at a championship level. And and a, a time when, although I didn't play many games, it was one I look back on as well as a really good learning experience. And and I really learned what it meant to be a professional footballer playing for Bradford and how much um, the team meant to the town of Bradford as well. And you did, of course, you mentioned you played a couple of times there. Your professional debut <clears throat> come at Bradford City. What do you remember about the match? And personally, how do you think you played during the game? It was, yeah, we are playing Walsall away and I made my debut. I think I come on, we were 3-2 up, I think. And one of our defenders got injured. I come on and, um, yeah, unfortunately we conceded and we end up drawing the game of 3 all, But um you know although we probably should have won that game it was just all I can remember was just coming on and before I knew it I think I played 13 minutes but it was over in about 30 seconds it went so quick and you know when you make your debut professional debut it was one that you just it gives you so much motivation to be like yeah this is what I want to do like I want to you know be a professional footballer for as long as I can and and it gives you so much motivation to push on and, and kick on with it and the English lower leagues in particular have this real reputation about, I know I said football's cutthroat, but the English lower leagues really have that reputation about being really tough, really cutthroat. So was your experience there like that? And do you think the reputation's justified? Yeah, I do think um, there's definitely a, a large turnover of players through the lower leagues in England. Like you think it's quite rare you'll see a player sign for three or four years at one club you know you see contracts that, that go around especially in you know league one league two conference um, which i think it's called the national league now um you know players might only sign for a year or two years maximum so you do get a big big turnover of players and obviously every club's got the same ambition they want to be up there in the top six they want to be promoted and i feel that if they don't get promoted then they look to rebuild straight away they want to bring in more quality players and, and that's how you get that big big turnover and at the same breath as well you get a lot of players that aren't getting game time at their at their club and um, then they'll go out on loan to to a lower club or a club in the in the same league so then again you got players constantly moving constantly changing clubs and um, yeah so it is I would say it, it is cutthroat um, and it's just a lot of a lot of players moving around each season and, and even during the season through the transfer windows and you did move back to Australia after that, first of all, in South Australia. Was it always the plan for you that you were going to move back to Australia or were you in England, maybe Europe, looking for a different club and it maybe didn't work out, so you just moved back to Australia? Yeah, it come to a point where I spent two and a half years over there and um, I really just wanted to get to a club where I knew I could play games. And after spending two and a half years, I was ready to to come home. I felt like I felt like I had improved a lot as a player and I knew that if I could come back to Adelaide, um, where my where my family are and, and and my friends, I knew that if I could come back to Adelaide, I knew I'd be able to get some good solid games in. So I come back to Australia and sign for Metro Stars in 2018. And yeah, it turned out to be a really good year. Um I think we finished, um, we got to the semi-finals. Um, overall we had a good year and and for me personally I got you know I played I think near enough every game that year and and just enjoyed playing week in week out again and, and was able to show that you know the time that I spent in Europe um, I had improved a lot and I come back to, to the MPO, MPOSA and, and was able to be you know like a solid player in the league. Now I personally remember you more so at Adelaide City in the MPL being, you know, top tier defender for that league, top tier player. But the unfortunate thing about Australian football is the NPL is full of all these really, really talented players, but a lot of the time A League clubs don't have a look at them. I know I spoke to Joey Gibbs a couple of weeks ago. He scored a few goals in the FFA Cup, as it was known back then. But he told me he didn't get any interest for that because he was 25. So for you being this, you know, player doing very well in the NPL, consistently putting in good performances, but not getting any A League interest yet, how difficult was that for you to sort of mentally deal with? And was there ever a moment where you thought that maybe the professional game was just not going to come again to you? 
Yeah, it it is tough. Um, you know, you do you play a number of good seasons in the NPL, and I guess in terms of my mindset, I realised that yeah, as you said, that maybe professional football wasn't going to work out for me. So during that time, um, although I was focusing heavily on football, I also put my focus towards other things. Like I studied to be a teacher, so I was able to finish my um, bachelor's and, and get a master's degree in in secondary teaching. So. That was a, you know, although I was still heavily focused on football, I did apply myself, you know, to, to study to make sure that, you know, okay, if this doesn't happen, then I've got something to fall back on. So I was lucky in the sense that I was able to do that, play for Adelaide City um, and my Melbourne club at the time. And, um, you know, and then as football does, things work out when you least expect it. So, you know, when the call come from Adelaide United, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting it. I knew I was, you know, I was playing relatively well for Adelaide City in the, in the NPL, but I just thought, you know, I can't really control too much. All I can control is my performances for Adelaide City. And if something comes up, and thankfully it did, then, yeah, I just had to focus on myself and make sure I was playing well and, and hope that the rest would take care of itself. Now, you just mentioned that move to Adelaide United. That kind of come halfway through the season. From memory, you were actually an injury replacement player. So you were fully thrown into the deep end of professional football again. You've only got maybe a few months to prove yourself worthy of getting signed on again for a new contract. So when you first got thrown into that, started getting matches and stuff in the A-League, did you find it difficult at all to prepare considering, you know, you're thrown in halfway through a season, everyone's already fit and in their rhythm? Or do you think maybe it helped you out in a way, the fact that, you know, you didn't have time to overthink it and you just have to play your game? Yeah, I think at the start it was difficult just because, you know, the A-League is is a good level and, and it, there is a, a fairly big difference between MPL and, and A-League. And yes, I was thrown into the deep end and it probably wasn't the best, um, you know, preparation to my A-League career. But at the same, in the same breath, I would say that it has held me well um, for the position I'm in now because I know that, you know, I went in maybe slightly underprepared and, and didn't perform as well as I know that I could have. Um, and it was a you know tough start to my A-League career, but knowing that I got through that has helped me well to be able to think, okay, if I can get through that, then you know I can I can keep working and and I'm only going to improve. So although it did take time to to adjust, it's it's one that I look back on and be like, okay, yeah, it was tough, but I got through it, um, and now I can you know focus on keep getting more games for Adelaide United, playing well for the team, and 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 achieving what we want to achieve as a team and and me personally. And that moment when the club told you that, yes, they were going to re-sign you, how much of a relief was that for you? And, you know, what sort of celebrations did you have when you got offered the contract? It was a um, it was a big relief because the injury replacement contract I signed was only for six months. So for the majority of that six months, I was unsure whether I was what I was going to be doing next year. I didn't know if I was going to be playing for Adelaide United again. I didn't know if I was going to be back teaching in the classroom. So when I found out that they were going to extend my contract for another two years, it took a big, big relief off my shoulders and, and it gave me time to be like, okay, I've got two years now to to really um, consolidate myself in the A-League and become a good good central defender in the competition and, and for Adelaide United. And um, yeah, it's it obviously worked out well. And in terms of celebrations, um, we didn't really do too much. Obviously, my mum and dad were were very happy for me. Same with my partner; she was she was excited, and and it just gave us a bit more stability, knowing what I was going to be doing for the next two years. Um, so for Adelaide United to put that faith in me, um, it just gives me more motivation, you know, to to repay them um, for the faith they've put in me, and 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 I enjoy every time I get to put on the the red strip and and represent Adelaide United. And you've had a lot of good firsts at Adelaide United. One of the firsts was actually your first professional goal. Can you talk us through that goal and how do you rate your finish? To get it away from the box. Clough just bombs away. Back in, Ibasuki is up. Ready is down. And the ball through is in! It's a first A-League goal for Lachlan Barr. And it breaks the deadlock in Adelaide. And... Um... Yeah, it's obviously um, one, you know, being a central defender, we don't score too many. Um, and for me to score my first professional goal at home at Cooper Stadium, it's honestly, yeah, it's the best feeling you you can ever have. And um, yeah, I just remember the game. It was uh, it was against Perth at home and and we start off the game relatively well. Perth come, you know, they were sitting quite deep. So we had a lot of the ball and 
And yeah, I just remember being, I think it was a, a, a free kick that got um, headed back out. And I think it was Zach Clough who crossed it in and, and it was sort of just the ball was up in the air and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go for this. And yeah, managed to get my uh, head on it. And and luckily there was no one in the, in the goal. I think the goalkeeper had come out for the ball. He missed it. So yeah, it was basically an open goal, but yeah, the best feeling ever to score my first professional goal and especially at home. And I mentioned in the introduction, you're a bit of a cult icon already for Adelaide United. I think one of the things that Adelaide fans really seem to love and respect about you is the fact that you just put your all on the line for the team. And a few weeks ago, you kind of went viral for an incident with Marcelo where you come running in pretty much to pr- protect um, Nestor Irankunda, who he had in a headlock, you know, face to face with his big six foot six defender. How do you turn on that switch and turn it off during a game? You know, that switch where you just put everything on the line for your team. Pennant Hills. And there's a bit of argy-bargy with you and Hoff. You get shown a yellow card and Irwin Kunda wants to take it further. Oh, this is all getting ugly. Lachlan Barr and Marcelo now squaring up. Two big, strong men. Goodness me. Locked in a bear hug. Yeah, it's one that you know every week, um, every week is 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 going to be a battle. So I think in the A League, no result when when you win a game, it, no win comes easy. So you're always going to have to work hard um, to be able to get the reward of of the three points. And for that game um, against Western Sydney, it was just one of those games where it's always going to be tough going to Western Sydney playing in in Parramatta at Combank Stadium. Um, I think we were second and they were third or fourth. So, you know, in terms of the table positioning, it was a big game. And I just remember, you know, the, the, we were three, two up and, and, you know, the game had been played in a reasonable manner up until then. It wasn't, you know, like a, you know, everyone was very passionate about the game, but there was nothing nasty up until then. And yeah, I just remember there was a bit of a um, argy bargy with Nesta pushing um, Callum Nyonhoff, and yeah, the Marcelo, the centre back, come over and and just yeah, got him in a headlock from behind, and yeah, it was just I didn't really think too much about it, but you know, I was conscious enough to understand that that's you can't be doing that to any player, let alone a young player. And it's not like Nesta. Everyone knows Nesta Irakunda in the league. Everyone knows that Adelaide United has got a seventeen-year-old wonder kid, so. You know, for him to do that, I just wanted to make a point that it wasn't it wasn't acceptable. And and as players of Adelaide United, especially us older boys, you know, you're not going to treat our our younger players like that. And you know, I didn't um I didn't you know go to him like aggressively or anything like that. I didn't you know push him or or have my hands up or anything. I just wanted to let him know that you know you're not going to that's not acceptable and, and we're not going to tolerate that as as Adelaide United players. And finally, not just Adelaide United, but also yourself has had a really good start to 2023 already, even though we're about halfway through it. But if all things go to plan for you for the rest of 2023, what can we expect to see from Lockie Barr? Yeah, obviously we're coming into our first leg of our semifinals um, against Central Coast at home. So I hope to play a part in that. Um, we had a good result last week um, against Wellington, 2-0 win, and, and unfortunately, I was on the bench. So, um, But the players that, that come in, they played exceptionally well. So I hope to play a role over the next uh, two-legged uh, semi-final games. And then if we make the grand final, um, then I would definitely love to play a part in that because, you know, semi-finals, let alone grand finals, they don't come around so often. So these are the games you look forward to. At the start of preseason, um, you know, you do all the work through the year and and these are the games you want to be a part of. And then, you know, hopefully from there we can make the final and whoever we play, hopefully we can win and um, then we'll go on our off season and then come back for the rest of um, 2023 and start the next season. So for me, it's just, um, yeah, I'm going to keep working hard and um, keep pushing myself and try and get as many games as possible keep trying to help the team achieve what we want to achieve, which this year is is to go one step further than we did last year, which is to make the grand final. And then I guess when you're in the grand final, if you go that far, you might as well try and win it. So, which is exactly what we'll be doing. And yeah, for me moving forward, it's just going to be, yeah, trying to get as many games for Adelaide as possible um, and trying to consolidate our, our position as a team, as a consistent, you know, top two team. We want to be finishing top two, unfortunately, that was our goal this year and we and we fell up just short um finishing third so 
that'll definitely be um, one of our next goals is to finish you know, in that top two and continue doing well in the finals. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your incredible football journey with me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for having me, mate. I appreciate it. This video is sponsored by Arrow Sport. Go to the link in the description and the friendly team at Arrow Sport will help you create your own football dream jersey. Whether it's starting from scratch or using one of their many templates on their website, creating a jersey with Arrow Sports is easy and prices start from just $50. Go to www.arrowsport.com.au and make your football kit dreams become a reality.